I love that we had a gospel song today. That was very gospel. That was very good. You know, Paul talked about spreading the gospel and enjoying the fruit of the gospel, and then we had a little gospel choir. Wonderful. Well, I think I've made all the announcements that I needed to make about what's happening in the parish life. Uh, I did want to ask for your help on something, and this is something that has been going on for a while, but it came to a little bit of a head this week. Nick, why don't you show this picture up on the uh, screen? So I don't know, this is a little boy at our preschool. His name is Ryder. Uh, if you know Dave and Judy Wiggins, uh, this is going to be a little bit obscure. It's their son's wife's sister's, the mother of this child. He has a twin brother, and they, go, they both go to the preschool. The problem is this little boy has terminal brain cancer. He wasn't able to come to school for a while, and now he's been. And um, if you know McKenna Clare Foundation, they're helping with the family. But his mother, if you've ever been around people that have a child that's sick uh, or has a terminal diagnosis, it's a lot of work. Caring for them is a lot of work. And so the mother came uh, this week and she said, hey, you know, I'm looking for some work. And I said, you're looking for some work. I said, seems like you have a lot of work. And she goes, yeah, but, uh, you know, we need more help. Like we're getting kind of crushed with uh, obligations and I just need to work. And, and I go, well, let's, maybe we can help you for a little bit because, you know, they're trying to fill a little gap. It's not a long-term thing. She's trying to fill a little gap. So we're going to try and raise some money for them. And if you'd like to give some money, um, we're going to raise hopefully 4000 3500 to 4000 I'll get them over the little hump they're in right now and give them some breathing room. Um, and we could have just taken money out of the Good Sam Fund, but I wanted to show you this picture because he's ours. It's our school. The mother's here every day. And whenever we see them, we bless them. We pray for them. And really, the prayers have uh, helped. The medicine's helped. But his diagnosis is terminal. So the day will probably come where he'll be here, and we'll be here, and we'll be doing his funeral. But until then, um, we'll try and uh, help them the way we can. See, this is what happens when you go on retreat and you don't sleep enough. But, uh, but this is what the church is for. The church is for coming around people, supporting people. And when people say, I need to do this myself, uh, and you say, you don't have to. We'll do it with you. We'll help you. And so if you'd like to make a gift... Uh, you can do it through the website, you can do it through the offering, you can do it through the office, and you can just put Ryder uh, is his name. And uh, keep him in your prayers. And we're actually planning uh, his baptism next month, he and his brother. It's hard when you have a twin and your twin's totally healthy. You know, and that's hard when you're the parent, and, uh, and I'm a twin, uh, neither of us are that healthy, but um, it's hard because you want to give his brother a normal life and you can't and what does a normal life look like and so on um so anyhow i wanted to share that with you because it's part of our life here that made me think there was something else i was going to tell you and i don't remember what it was well i guess that's all right uh we did move you know eric who's our um uh the guy that came to us in addiction he moved into his new house this week, and he's actually going to be starting at the church as a little bit of a handyman. We're calling him Don 2.0, if you remember Don, uh, which is someone who came off the street, and we're giving them some work, and now our, our time of supporting him is finished. Now he'll be working, and he'll be providing for himself. So we took someone who was found in addiction and really in bad health, and through the church's support, he's on the path to self-sufficiency, and that's the goal, right? And I remembered what it was. You should, if you read, Eric Skinrood wrote an article that was in the news this week about Ray Calloway, who's a Huntington Beach resident in his 90s. And if you remember when they used to set off atomic bombs in Nevada and then have soldiers run into the mushroom cloud, uh, one of those guys is still alive in Huntington Beach. And Eric wrote a really good profile about him. Was it in the Daily Pilot? Or in, I can't remember, yeah, it was in the Daily Pilot. And you can look it up. Uh, and this is something that when we were in Hiroshima and talking to some of the atomic bomb survivors, or at least one survivor, see, the problem with all that radiation 
uh, is the neutrons that get released during an atomic blast. They go through your body and they disassemble you at the atomic level. So, you know, where all, the, where all of the nuclei and uh, everything are, they literally come apart at the atomic level and you can't put it back. And so when we think about what God's trying to do, like that's what was wonderful about that song they were singing is um, when they said, I, I don't got time to die because I'm too busy working for the kingdom. Kingdom work is God's answer to a world where you can literally be disassembled at the atomic level, where there is no medicine, there is no healing, there is no reassembling you. Uh, and that's why people who are, uh, have radiation poisoning their bone marrow dies and their GI tract dies because those are two very active places where you're producing new cells and that's where you're being disassembled on the way to your death. And that's not what God wanted for us. God did not want us to be disassembled. God did not want us to come apart in the place where we're supposed to be most alive. And so this is why Jesus begins his public ministry. This is why Jesus shows up at the synagogue in Capernaum. This is why Jesus set someone free. You'll remember he had a word in the church that cast out a demon last week. <clears throat> and this week, he leaves church and goes to Simon and Andrew's house. Now, I was thinking about it. I wasn't sure and can't remember uh, who might live closest to the church. You know, we have a few people that live very close to the church. None of you live as close as Simon and Andrew. Uh, literally, if you go to Capernaum, their house is where the grass is, you know, so it's like they literally walk out and then immediately they're at the house. Um, they didn't have to worry about parking, <laughs> so everything could be built closer. And now this is the interesting thing, is how do you take the Word of God that people heard in the church, this Word of God that sets people free, and how do you bring it home? It's a very short distance at Capernaum, but what happens when that Word of freedom and that word of beyond assembly, because God's going to do more than just reassemble us at the atomic level, how does that word get heard at home? And this is one of the things, like when we were on the retreat this weekend, and uh, as I said to you, this is one of the last places in the Lutheran church where people come together and there's this vitality among the different churches. We're living in a time where many homes are a spiritual desert. It's kind of a warehouse where people just go and they rest until they go back to work or they go to school. And so how is it that we can bring rain to the desert? And one of the ways is this word of God, which you hear in the church, is a word that goes home with you. And that there is some problem or some issue that God might want to address, some illness, as we see with Peter's mother-in-law. Now you have to remember, Simon and Peter very recently left the fishing business. And so you can imagine that people like Peter's mother-in-law may not be so hot on Jesus. We don't know. There's no details about it. But this would be like having the person, you know, that destroyed the family business come and spend time at your house. And you go, oh, he had to come over? <laughs> but we don't know if he, uh, we don't know how they felt, except to say that it may not have been in a welcome visit. You know, we, I think we always think that when Jesus goes to please, those people go, oh, Jesus, you're here, please come in. There are people where Jesus' message and work interrupted something important in their life, and they're not that happy about it. And so in this case, we have someone now who's sick, the mother-in-law, and we don't know what her fever is. It just says she's burning up with fever. So it could be their version of COVID, just sort of a quick illness. It could be a long-term illness. It could be something she is struggling with, and she can't get out of bed. And Jesus comes and brings that word that was in the church to the home, and God wants both places to be free. When we talk about the human ecosystem being redeemed, God wants every place to be full of life. God isn't just looking for the public celebration of our faith. God's looking for the private embrace of that same gift so that every place can be well. Now we can pause here for a minute because you'll notice throughout the Gospel of Mark, which we're in this year, there's going to be lots of times where Jesus doesn't appear to want to keep healing or it doesn't appear that Jesus wants people to know who he is and there's going to be this constant tension in the book because, of course, the one thing Jesus isn't healing people for is to just let them go back to doing what they were doing before. When the healing of Jesus comes, it comes with the word about doing this kingdom work, and it will come with a kind of transformation. The gospel is not a sort of secret medical technology that can be deployed so that everyone can just go back and do what they want. 
The healing that comes means that you are conscripted freely. That might be a contradiction. You are invited into the, the wholeness and the gift that comes with the kingdom. And we see that with Peter's mother-in-law because it said she gets up and she served them. And sometimes people go, well, if, they go, oh, well, this sounds familiar. You know, you just get over being sick and people go, what's for dinner? And you go, I just, I was just sick. You know, like, why are you asking me what's for dinner? That's not, I don't think that's what's happening here. Uh, the word that gets used for service, and it's a generic word, but it's significant, is the same word we use for deacons. It's the same word we use for holy service, meaning that she gets up and she serves them, but her service is now consonant and resonating with the gift that Jesus gave her in the healing. And so this is the question, how it is that even in our homes, there can be a resonating familiarity of God's love and the gift and a kind of mutual service with one another. Now, if you've ever gotten prescription filled, you know, and they go, well, we only have this many pills or we only have this many refills. Uh, the question might be if the gift that Jesus brings is a finite resource. You know, well, sorry, we're out of doses, but we're hoping to have some more. And that's not the case. You know, all these people hear about what he did in the synagogue, and it's the Sabbath, and they're not sure that the healing work that he's doing is consistent with keeping God's law, so they all wait till the sun goes down so that they don't violate Sabbath. And Jesus is going to have this tension throughout his ministry where people wonder if what he is doing is what God would do. And he keeps telling them, yes, it is, because I happen to be God. So when I'm doing stuff on the Sabbath, it is consistent with the gift of rest, and it is consistent with the gift of dignity. And this is one of the things we can say about evil, is that evil is the enemy of our human nature, and evil will always diminish or attempt to diminish the dignity of the person. And what we find is actually evil doesn't have the power to diminish the dignity of victims, it has the power to diminish the dignity of the perpetrators. It is the perpetrators who become more animalistic. It is the perpetrators who exchanged the gift of their nature for something less. And this is exactly the power that Jesus is freeing them from. Because he's not just a walk-in clinic for biological illnesses. He also is dealing with spiritual problems, including demons. And Capernaum's not a very big town, but there are a lot of sick people there. There's a lot of demons there. There's a lot of activity that the kingdom needs to address. Imagine if God did this in Huntington Beach. You know, it's a lot bigger than Capernaum. A lot more parking, so it's a lot more spread out. But there's a lot of sickness. There's a lot of demonic activity. There's a lot of things happening that are an attempt to diminish human dignity. And not just, I mean, it's the world. It's not just our city or Capernaum, it's the whole world where these things are attempted to happen. And you'll notice that Jesus will not let the demons tell people who he is. And this is an interesting detail. People go, well, why would he do that? It seems that's the whole point. Jesus wants to tell people who he is. Jesus is not looking for people to have a technical knowledge about who he is. He doesn't want people to just say, oh, yes, well, I read the definition on Wikipedia and it says he's the Messiah, so that's nice. Jesus isn't looking for mental assent. He's looking for people to be folded into his service. He's looking for people who not only confess but love, because the demons do not love him. They know him, but they do not love him. And so that confession doesn't mean anything if it doesn't come with a kind of transforming experience of love so that you too can participate in this special work of healing. In a world where people can be disassembled on the atomic level, you become part of God's antidote. And also, Jesus refuses to let people set the ceiling too low. The ceiling isn't just going to be healing. The ceiling is going to be raising people from the dead. Now, we have some pretty significant medical technology today that can almost kill you in the attempt to make you better. Chemotherapy, for example. Bone marrow transplants, for example. We will bring you as close to death as possible. Or sometimes when they almost freeze people into a deep cold after they've had a cardiac incident, trying to then warm them slowly back up, we bring you as close to death as possible to try and bring you back for healing. Well, Jesus goes beyond that. Jesus actually brings you to death, and you're dead, and then he brings you back. And we go, well, that doesn't seem possible. 
they don't do that at Kaiser. Yeah, how is that possible? And this is what we talk about when we're talking about faith. You have to trust that when you give Jesus your life, you are consenting to the physician leading you to a place of the death, the cross, but with the promise that it will come with new life. And this is the gift. Now you'll notice that Jesus flees from Capernaum. He walks away. Maybe he goes down by the Sea of Galilee and they're all looking around for him because now there's a, a certain frenetic energy. You know, now everyone wants the gift. But Jesus is going to be renewed in the presence of his Father. And this is why some kind of life of Christian devotion is necessary, whether it's prayer time, Bible time, time with colleagues, time with friends, men's group, women's group, whatever, monastic prayer. I don't know what it is you need, but you need this time of being in the presence of the Father so that you can be renewed in the work. You know, because otherwise what we do is we deplete all the resources and then we move on to the next thing. We do that all the time with everything. We deplete it all and move on to the next thing. We do it with celebrities all the time. We deplete them all and then we move to the next thing and that's why they end up so weird. Which is true, you know, we deplete them and then we go, well, who's next? Let's bring in another young one. Uh, and this is, this is not meant to be something that's depleted and emptied. It's something to be constantly renewed. And this is why the prophet Isaiah had this wonderful refrain for us today, have you not known? Have you not heard? Is this the first time you guys are hearing about this stuff? And the people go, what? And he goes, have you not known? Have you not heard? We've been talking about this now for centuries. And they're like, yeah, but things have been going really bad for us. So we're not sure it's true. Oh my gosh, you guys are worried about politics. You know, Babylonian politics. Babylon means nothing to God. God is above all of this, says Isaiah. I know, but things in our time, you know, this is what we're fixated on. And he goes, you guys, you're like grass. And these Babylonian kings and these Persian kings and these politicians and people running for office, they're going to be here one day and gone the next, and God's still going to be there. Have you not known? Have you not heard? And they go, well, we have, but we're still anxious about the time in which we live and what's happening to us. And so the prophet Isaiah is reminding us the scale of the gift, the reliability of the giver, and that spending time in that presence has a wonderful renewing factor because Isaiah says, look, this isn't a game where it's like, well, if you're young, then it's, you know, it's a young person's world. He said, you will be renewed. You will be able to run. You will be refreshed because it will be God doing this refreshing work. And there's this wonderful little thing at the end of that reading from 1 Corinthians where Paul is talking and he says, I can be all things to all people. Which is funny, because sometimes people give the opposite advice. You can't be all things to all people. And then Paul goes, oh yes, you can. I have. Paul tries to find ways that he can connect with every person he meets with the possibility of building communion. Now, Paul's goal is the sharing of the gospel, meaning more people called into this work of healing and wholeness. That's the church's missionary activity, is through the gospel to find connections and ways to connect with people. And this is an interesting exercise in a time of suspicion and kind of tribal conformity when you have people who are comfortable moving between different groups, finding solidarity and affinity with different groups because they realize that the story we're a part of is much bigger than the story that a lot of people are living. This is the gift we have. When Isaiah says, have you not known, have you not heard? There's something so much bigger going on here that the things that normally divide human beings are no longer a factor when you see the kingdom work that Jesus is doing. And it's not just, oh man, I wish we could have been in Capernaum that day. That would have been cool. Jesus goes, let's take this somewhere else, to another village, and then to another village, and then to another village, and then to the Jerusalem, and to the Gentiles, and all around the world. This message goes, and here we are thousands of years later in Huntington Beach telling the same stories being called into the same gift. And so I hope that you hear a life-giving word in this place, and I hope that you'll take this life-giving word and take it home with you and have it renew you there, and like Peter's mother-in-law, be called into a kind of serving love because you are part of something much bigger. You are part of one who brings us to life. And it doesn't matter if you're a little boy with terminal cancer. It doesn't matter if you're growing old in the Lutheran church. None of this stuff matters because we're all heading toward the same place, to a place of everlasting life. Amen.